Santo, 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 Señor Onipotente, siempre el labio mío, lo te dará Santo, Santo, Santo te adoro reverente Dios en tres personas bendita Please join me in this morning one and prayer. Amado Dios, nos reunimos en este lugar santo para adorarte y expresar nuestra gratitud por las bendiciones que derramas en nuestras vidas cada día. Te damos gracias por la comunidad de fe que nos rodea, por el amor incondicional que nos ofreces y por la oportunidad de servir a los demás. En tu nombre, Jesús. Amén. Amén. We are gathered here on this joyful day, so let us Pass the peace of Christ and greet one another in love. Well, welcome to First United Methodist Church of Waxahachie, Texas. Bienvenidos a todos a la Primera Iglesia Metodista de Waxahachie, en Texas. We are so glad to have everyone gathered in our sanctuary and those who are joining us online. Thank you for being here, friends. Esperemos que disfrute de este hermoso servicio y que pueda regocijarse de la presencia de Dios entre nosotros. Bienvenidos. Thank you, and you may be seated. We come to the time in our, in our beautiful service when we pray together 
and the memorial candle burns in remembrance of Edwin Farah. We had a wonderful celebration of his life here yesterday. And so please keep his family in your prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the Lord of new beginnings. In the wisdom of Christ, you make all things new. Make us new through your transforming power so that we may be your hands and feet and voice for justice and peace, so that all may share in the healing and forgiveness Christ brings. We give you thanks for Jesus, who dissolved the barrier between the divine and human, whose life has broken down the dividing walls between friend and enemy, and whose death and resurrection crucified the stumbling block between life and everlasting life. Nothing can separate us from your love. By your gift of faith, help us to believe the truth of your grace and your love for us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us in your steadfast faith and love that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister in your name with justice and compassion. When hatred seems to be the answer, help us to offer better solutions. Where unforgiveness is the motivation, help us to offer preemptive love. When the world seems broken beyond repair, send us forth to mend in love and grace. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. 
Oh, we are so blessed by the wonderful musicians we have at this church, and I love it when we're all together. What a joy it is. In Acts 20, the Apostle Paul reminds us of something important Jesus said about giving. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's tempting for us to only look at the return on our investment, on the results of what our generosity might have done. We want to know that what we give, it's making a difference, and that is worthwhile. We are supposed to be excellent stewards of what God has given us. But sometimes being generous and giving is more about what God does in our hearts. We are entering that moment when we are challenged to listen to the Holy Spirit and to be led by this gift of generosity, this being blessed through giving. Will our ushers please come forward? Will you pray with me? Dear God, we love you and we want to give you ourselves. Help us in this time, O oh Lord, to listen and to receive that blessing that you give us by being a part of your stewardship and your generosity. O oh Lord, fill our hearts with your spirit. Grant us grace and peace and bless each gift and give her in your name. Amen.
Our hymn of preparation this morning is In Unity We Lift Our Song. Very lovely words by Ken Miedema. You will know the tune. Let's remain standing as we sing. mañana vamos a leer el libro de Génesis, capítulo 50, verso del 15 al 21. Cuando los hermanos de José vieron que su padre había muerto, dijeron, ¿y si José nos guarda rencor y nos paga por todos los males que le hicimos? Entonces enviaron un mensaje a José diciendo, tu padre dejó estas instrucciones antes de morir. Esto es lo que debes decirle a José. Te pido que perdones a tus hermanos los pecados y las injusticias que cometieron al tratarte así, Ahora, por favor, perdona los pecados de los siervos de Dios de tu padre. Cuando le llegó el mensaje, José lloró. Entonces, vinieron sus hermanos y se postraron delante de él. Somos sus esclavos, dijeron. Pero José les dijo, no temáis, estoy en el lugar de Dios. Vosotros pensáis hacerme daño, pero Dios lo encaminó a bien, 
para lograr lo que ahora se hace. Proveeré a ti y a tus hijos. Él los tranquilizó y les habló amablemente salvación a sus vidas. Así que no temáis, yo te seguiré cuidando a ti y a tus hijos. Esta es la palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and receiving of these words. Please be seated. What a joy it is to have our bishop here today, Bishop Reuben Sines, Jr. He's a native of South Texas and a lifelong United Methodist. He served congregations from Dallas to El Paso, and his congregation in Edinburgh was the largest Hispanic American uh, church in the United States during his tenure there. He's planted 11 churches, and he's served throughout leadership in the United Methodist Church. And we are so thrilled that he was named our bishop, and he has many, many churches, many pastors that he shepherds. And so for him to come and give us this special service, we are so thankful. Will you join me in welcoming Bishop Signs? Thank you, Val. Good morning. The peace of Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It's such a joy to be here and to pinch hit for your pastor, Kevin Tully, this morning. Uh, he asked me to, to preach because he was going to be away, and so I have a meeting with the clergy and laity this afternoon just to talk about where we're going as a United Methodist Church in Texas. So if you have time this afternoon, you're welcome to come by at 3 o'clock. I think we're meeting at, in your beautiful fellowship hall. By the way, you have a beautiful church. And as I did my research, I learned about your ministries. For example, like the backpack ministry where you send food with children who, don't, who are food insecure and they have something to eat over the weekend and the way that you serve the community. And I saw also your campaign for a building for all which means that you have an eye, just not just for yourselves, but for the community where, where God has planted you. One of the things that you're known for in the community is your service, the way that you reach out and serve others. I think you're having a, a WOW event, is that correct, Val? Yes. Where you're getting together with other churches to meet the needs of the community. And, and so the, these are things that make the heart of, of God sing. And by, speaking about singing, what a wonderful music ministry this church has. From the um, brass wind persons to your director to the choir, I turned around and I told the choir, I thought I had cherubims and seraphims singing behind me when, when you sang. And it, it just makes this place holy and we can experience the presence of God. This is, this is a, a special place where we know we're gonna encounter God in a new way this morning. Bienvenidos a mis hermanos de Alfa. Que Dios les bendiga. Voy a hablar un poco en español y en inglés, uh, pero por favor tengan paciencia conmigo y si quieren después nos quedamos un rato para explicar los, los puntos salientes de verdad del mensaje. I just told my brethren that, uh, you know, if I preach bilingually, this will go twice a time, and I know that I'm standing before between you and lunch, and so. Um, I, and I used to preach bilingually when I was pastoring in Edinburgh and, and El Paso because I had persons that were predominantly Spanish speaking, those that were bilingual, and those that were only English speaking, right? The, the later the generations became, the more English they spoke and the less Spanish they, they could actually, you know, uh, speak. And so, my, like my kids, for example, they understand Spanish, but, but they don't really speak it, right? But said, we know what you're saying, Dad. Okay, that's all right. So they'll, they'll check me on that. But it's very frustrating for people that are bilingual to have a back and forth in English and Spanish because you get it the first time. There's no need for the second. <laughs> so I, I get it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it mostly in English today, although I, I, I could do it both ways. But I might, if I have some Spanish, it's just to bring my, my brothers and sisters in. It was great to see the modern and the alpha uh, uh, worship team here today. And it's beautiful to see what you're trying to do, what God is leading you to do. I'm going to read the scripture again in English because I think it's important that we get it in our ears. And this is from Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. And Joseph is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. The more I read it, the more I see in it, and I hope that what I, what I have um, seen in it today will bless your hearts and drive you closer to the mercy of God for God's help. 
uh, realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all, uh, and for all the wrong that we did to him? And so they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. And Joseph said to them, Joseph, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to harm me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing now. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Let us pray. Lord, we, we know that the capacity to forgive in us is limited. If we're brutally honest, we struggle a lot with it. And it's only by your grace and by the working of your spirit in our lives that we're able to, to extend it to others and perhaps even to ourselves. So this morning, Lord, we pray that you would begin to soften our hearts and our minds and our spirits and that our lives would be changed because of your work in us. Help us, Lord God, to, to be people of reconciliation and resolution instead of people of division and escalation of harm and violence. And so, Lord, may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So, two neighbors have been friends all of their life, and then something happened. Something happened. And, and they fell into disagreement because one neighbor uh, offended the other. And so the offended neighbor wanted justice. He wanted, he wanted for the other person to make it right. And so he took the case to a judge. Am I on? Yes? Yes? No. Okay. He took the case to a judge and He took the case to a judge, <laughs> and, the, and the judge, not wanting to, you know, he said, well, this, this can be resolved. So he put the power to decide on the punishment to the offended person, and he said, okay, look, we're, I'm going to make a judgment, but my judgment will be your judgment. So whatever you want the punishment for your neighbor to be, it'll be double what you ask for yourself. You get it? So if he wanted his neighbor to lose all of his land, he'd at least have to give up half of his. You, you, see, the, you see the issue there? So the man thought about it for a while. And then he said, I know what. He said, I want to be blind in one eye so that his neighbor could be blind in two. Some people would rather go through life with partial eyesight and vision than to let things go and to make peace and move forward. Because the fact is that Jesus said, forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. Okay, but where's the fun in that? Where's the fun in that? As a culture, we, we delight in revenge stories. We love to see revenge. We love to see vigilante stories when people take matters into their own hands and exact justice for the wrongs that they have suffered. Barnes and Nobles has a, uh, a list of the best revenge stories in literature. I, I looked it up. The Iliad, for example, by Homer is the granddaddy of all revenge stories. Everybody's seeking revenge. Even the gods are seeking revenge on each other. Carrie by Stephen King is a story of a bully teenager who gets brutal revenge on her peers at prom. 
Hamlet by William Shakespeare revolves around Prince Hamlet of Denmark's quest to avenge his father's murder. True Grit by Charles Pruitt is about a relentless 14-year-old girl who will not stop until she avenges the death of her father. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas is about Dante's ex ex uh, executing revenge against those responsible for his unjust imprisonment. And it goes on and on and on. Not to mention the John Wick movies. Anyway. <laughs> and then there's revenge in the Bible. Samson wanted revenge on the Philistines. He said, God, just give me the strength one more time to destroy all these Philistines. Jezebel swears to kill Elijah to take revenge upon him for killing her prophets. The disciples are walking through Samaria, and they tell Jesus, shall we call fire down upon these people to destroy them for rejecting you? Everybody wants their peace. Everybody wants to get others to get theirs for the harm that they've experienced. Peter's question, Jesus, how many times must I forgive my neighbor? Seven times? I think the behind that question was, how many times do I forgive them before I can be justified in retaliating? I think that's the real question behind the question. When can I start to get even after all this injustice? And Jesus says 70 times 70. 7 times 70. Mm. Forgiveness has a power to mend shattered friendships and relationships and transform lives for the better. But it's so hard. It is just so hard because we have a tendency to hold resentment and anger and the need for revenge. And it affects our spiritual and emotional life and it's harmful to our relationships. It's toxic to live bitterly. It affects our relationship with others and affects our relationship with God. And it spirals us downward. But forgiveness opens up new possibilities for growth and resilience and compassion and faith and, and harmony and trust in God. And today's story about Joseph could have easily been another revenge story in, the, in, the, in Genesis. Because Genesis is full of revenge stories. We have Cain and Abel, for example. Right? We have the brothers and, and Noah's sons, and, and we, have, we have Abraham and, and, uh, and Rachel and Rebecca and, and all those stories about favoritism and jealousy and, and waiting until, plotting until they can get back at their brother or their sister or their parent. It all goes on and on and on through Genesis. If you look at the Genesis narrative, it's like everybody's trying to one-up each other for the harms they've experienced from one another. And in a way, it's beautiful that, that Genesis ends with a reconciliation of a family that has been so divided and so broken by harm and the lack of forgiveness and anger and resentment and, and, and holding on to grudges and bitterness that it then gives us hope. Joseph's story is a remarkable tale of resilience and of faith and forgiveness. And that's why I like it so much. And I'm not going to go into all the Joseph story, but Joseph was a favorite of Jacob. And he had 10 other brothers, older brothers, who resented Joseph for being the favorite. They didn't like it that he was dad's favorite. I know some of you don't know what that feels like. Uh, my, my kids, whenever they contact my, my, my wife, they, they always get her phone and take a picture of themselves and then put on their call, your favorite son, your favorite daughter. And so they're always, for, for Mother's Day, they're always trying to beat each other to the, to the punch. At 12.01, the phone will start ringing, Mom, this is your favorite son, happy, happy Mother's Day, or whatever. And so they're always playing. My brother and I, for example, when I go to my parents' house, I have my wedding picture, my brother's wedding picture. And I'll go there, and my brother's wedding picture will be at the front of the hallway, and mine will be at the back. Well, I'll take mine from the back and put it in the front and move here. And so I know when I've been gone from home because there's my brother's wedding picture and mine's at the end of the hallway. So that, that's not going to happen. So jo Joseph has an issue because his brothers, you know, they, they can't stand him. They despise him because he gets all the special privileges while they get all the hard work of watching the goats. So eventually the, Joseph see an the, the brothers see an opportunity to put Joseph in his place. So first they think about killing him. And then Reuben intervenes. I think Reuben in the Bible is probably the most important person because he saved Israel and Jacob and everything else. But anyway, um, they decide to sell him. 
and he gets sold as a slave. He's humanly trafficked, he's sold as a slave. He gets accused falsely of, sed of seduction, gets put in prison, stays there for three years, becomes steward of everything, interprets dreams, the Pharaoh calls him up, puts him in charge of the whole land of Egypt, and now he becomes a governor. He becomes a secretary of state for Egypt, and now he's in a position of power. And he has saved grain for seven years, and, and now of plenty, and now comes the seven years of famine, and the whole world is starving to death. And Joseph's family decides we better go to Egypt to go get some food because we're going to starve out here. So his brothers go out there to Egypt and they get to Egypt and Joseph sees them and recognizes them, but they don't recognize who Joseph is because Joseph is dressed like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian and he looks like an Egyptian. And, jo and Joseph has completely acculturated himself to Egyptian life and his brothers don't even know who he is. And Joseph has the opportunity to really exact revenge now because he has the power. And so at the beginning of the story of the re-encounter, Joseph deals very harshly with him. He, he treats him badly and, and he calls them spies and he, he tests them and he makes them go through a lot of pain and suffering. And his brothers are thinking, oh my God, this thing that we have done to our little brother back so many years, now we're being held accountable by God. And so they're, they're suffering. Uh, these ten brothers are just in, ter in, in, in terrible pain because they're carrying around the guilt of what they've done for all these years. And eventually Joseph reveals himself to, to, to them and says, you know what? You all meant it to harm me, but God meant it for the good to save your life and the lives of many. And so Joseph relocates them in Egypt. But then there comes a time when the father dies. And the father is kind of like the one that keeps the peace in the family. Like my wife. Did you talk to your sister? Did you call your sister for her birthday? And when she hears that one brother or sibling has there's been an offense, she intervenes to make sure that everybody's in harmony. Right? She'll tell me. Your, your son texted you. Did you text him back? I said, oh, no, I've been on the road all day. I, I just don't have time for that. Did you see the Snapchat? And did you respond to the pictures of your, of your granddaughter playing soccer? I said, oh, I did it. You, you better respond. I said, now I have to respond all the time, mama. And so, and so, and, and so the, Maya is the one that kind of keeps everybody together. And so it's like as if Maya's gone one day, who's going to have that responsibility? All of a sudden, Jacob's gone, and the brothers are saying, uh-oh. Will Joseph, was he really restraining himself from getting back at us when dad was alive? But now that dad's gone, are we, are we in trouble? Is Joseph going to exact revenge on us for all that we did to him? So now the brothers, the brothers have already been forgiven, but they've been carrying around the guilt, and they can't forgive themselves all those years. And even after many years after the incidents and the forgiveness, they are still very anxious about their well-being before Joseph, who now has the power to crush them. And, and, and so this internalized guilt and lack of receiving forgiveness and, and reconciliation is festering throughout their lives. And so, and so Joseph receives them, and he assures them, no, no. We're not, we're not going to, to take that road. You are forgiven. I'm not holding what you did against me. Because Joseph has the ability to hold harm done to him against the bigger backdrop of what God is doing. So it's not just about him and his experience. Joseph sees what is happening, what has happened to him as part of the providence of God part of the provision of God to even use that horrible episode. And I think God would have gotten Joseph to Egypt one way or another. It just so happened that this happened, so, so God intervened and, and, and made it well again. That's what Romans says. All things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things. And so Joseph is, is really saying that for the first time. This is horrible. What you did to me was horrible. But look. God turned it into the good. And yes, I could have taken my power and vanquished all of you. But that would not 
bring wholeness. And that would be only temporary. And so Joseph here reconciles again with her brother and reassures them, it's, there's nothing between you and I. Live in peace. I'm going to take care of you and your families. Go back. Joseph, Joseph learned to trust God amid betrayal and much suffering and hardship. See, forgiveness is not easy. It's really not easy. It's a process. It's a process. I'm sure there were days when Joseph was in slavery to Potiphar or in jail, unjustly so, that he would think, one of these days, if I ever see my brothers, I'm going to make them pay for what they did to me. The day that I see them, when I've ever, if I ever get out of here, they're going to pay for it. I'm sure. He was human. As a matter of fact, the first time he saw them, he treated them harshly. But something happened in Joseph's life throughout time. God worked in his heart. Jesus taught and modeled forgiveness, and he talked about forgiveness maybe because we needed it. Maybe because we have trouble with forgiveness. He consistently emphasized the importance of forgiving others, even in difficult circumstances, and he taught his followers to forgive repeatedly, without limits. Man, that's hard. In the Lord's Prayer, God, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. That's our prayer. When people said, teach us to pray, forgive me, God, of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. Jesus was getting at the heart of what it means to reconcile and restore broken relationships. The parables of forgiveness, who can forget the prodigal son? That the young son said, Dad, when are you dying so I can get my inheritance? Because I'm getting tired of waiting for you to live, to, to die. So if you died sooner rather than later, I could get your inheritance, then I could do with it whatever I want to. And the father said, you don't have to wait until I die. Here's half of it, son. Oh, thanks, Dad. See you later. He goes and blows it all and then comes back, and what does the father do? Runs to embrace him, receive him, and throws a big feast. That's a, par that's a, that, that's a parable of forgiveness and love and mercy. And of course, you know, it's not just about forgiveness, it's about reconciling. Jesus says, hey, if you got something against your brother or sister, go and ask for forgiveness and then bring your gift to the altar. When Jesus reconciles Zechariah, uh, Zacchaeus, he not only forgives them, he, he restores them to the whole community and makes the community whole again that was broken. And of course, Jesus demonstrated forgiveness through his own actions. When he was crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. They don't know what they do. And he showed compassion and forgiveness to those responsible for his suffering. I see a lot of hurt. I see a lot of harm. Somebody asked, why do you need bishops to keep people from killing each other? I've been involved in more conflict than I care to, to, to imagine. I never thought that ministry was going to be about this. I never thought it would be, but I've seen so much harm and, and division and pain and loss. And when I get complaints, for example, would I get plenty of complaints? I said, when, whatever happened in the local church, it winds up at my, church, at my, at my desk most of the time in, in Kansas and Nebraska and, and now here. If it's not resolved at the local church, it just escalates. My main goal is to see how can we achieve forgiveness and reconciliation and a just resolution so that we can move on. The first goal is not to find culprits and destroy them. It's to restore 
so that healing can be experienced in the life of our church. And here's the truth. We don't generate forgiveness. I mean, I guess we could. But there's some forgiveness that we need God's help, but we just can't do it. And I think this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the Spirit of God. It's a gift of the Spirit that helps us in our weakness. You see, because forgiveness breaks the cycle of hatred. It breaks a cycle of harm, and it requires humility, but it also repairs division. It, it enables us to stop carrying this burden around a resentment and bitterness and anger and grudges with bitterness to focus our lives on things that really matter and let God be God. It brings us inner peace. Instead of having to wake up at night just thinking, how am I going to get even? How am I going to get even? How am I going to get even? And as I see this world, and I see people nursing past grievances with no solution or resolution or desire to be resolved, everybody has been harmed by everybody else. We as a church have something to say. We as a church have something to say. And it is a life-giving, life-changing, world-transforming message. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Forgiveness is not weakness. I wish it were. I wish forgiveness were cowardly. But it's not. It is spiritual and emotional strength that requires maturity of character. That's what it is. It's, it's Christian maturity. It's not weakness. It's not being a doormat. It, it, it takes spiritual maturity to, to take control of your own self and say, I, I choose not to be a victim, but to, but to move on with my life and invest myself in things that really matter and make a difference in the world and make me whole. Refraining from retaliation requires immense self-control. Immense. Look at Jesus. He could have called down a thousand angels and just wiped out everybody. But he restrained himself for the sake of our salvation. It takes tremendous amount to restrain when faced with adversity and when faced with harm and with pain. Taking the path of reconciliation is, gives an example to people that might not know any better. When they see the way we handle it, they say, oh, okay, so there is another way of doing this, not just the way of the sword. It inspires others towards peaceful resolutions instead of aggression and hostility. Our, our actions speak louder than our words and how we handle Opportunities without resorting to revengeful tactics can help other people do the same in their lives when they come up against it. So one of the lessons of Joseph's story is that true strength does not lie in retaliation, but in exercising restraint and trust in God. And God's spirit gives Joseph the power to choose peace over conflict at every step. It opens possibilities, new possibilities for us, for others, for our world, to bless the world with peace and to show the world that there is another way. I, I really appreciate that the Genesis narrative ends with a reconciliation of the family. Now God is ready to do something new for the people of Abraham, for us who have been invited to share in that, in that life, in that message, in that hope. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you're nursing a grudge or you're nursing guilt. 
maybe today is the time to just think about it different and let it go. And you say, but I can't. No, but the Lord can. If you need that grace in your life today, Christ is present. This is who Christ is. He frees us. He helps us understand that we're loved. And he gives us the ability to forgive and to set others free ourselves so that we can be free. Let us pray. Lord, you know every heart. You know every situation that every one of us has been through in life. If we're honest, we sometimes we carry the moments of hurt and harm deep within our hearts and our minds, and, and they're a part of who we are, and they affect, they affect how we relate to others and, and how we even begin to trust you. And so today I pray that your freeing grace would fall upon us. Set us free and cleanse us, Lord God, from the things in our hearts that we harbor that nobody might know. And make us free indeed, make us free in you. Free us for joyful obedience to you. Make us instruments of your peace in this broken and divided world. Enable us, Lord God, to be messengers of hope, that where there is hatred, we may sow love. Where there is discord, we may sow reconciliation. Where there, Lord God, is harm, we may be people that bring healing in your name. Bless this congregation. Help it to be a healed and a whole church for this community and for the world around us. In Christ's holy and healing name I pray, amen. Thank you, Bishop, for those powerful words. What a joy it has been to have you in worship with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment just to thank all the musicians who are with us this morning from Alpha, from Modern, the Chancel Choir, the Wind Ensemble. Our organist has a killer postlude, by the way. You might want to stick around for that. Our closing hymn this morning is number 368 in your hymnals, My Hope is Built. Let's stand and sing together, church. Oh, may I then in him be found, trust 
As we leave this place, what is our mission? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Well, we have a lot going on in our church. Let me try that again. We have a lot going on in our church in the next couple of weeks. And I want Matt Othier to please come up to the pulpit and tell us a little more about wow and what sh we should be doing because we are going to go and combine with eight other churches in our town and go out and spread worship and do work projects for lots of folks and this is our 11th year i believe that we've been doing this so matt if you'll come on up i already snuck up behind you Val. sorry there. <laughs> go ahead matt you, you're My, uh, sneaky matt i am my favorite phrase in scripture is from matthew 28 it's part of the great commission where Jesus starts by saying, therefore, go. My name is Matt Othier, and I'm part of the leadership team with WOW, and this is my ninth year to be part of that leadership team, and it's by far my favorite Sunday each and every year where we get to take the love of Christ outside of our building and into the community. And I can always tell when we're about two weeks away because David Linguist and Robert Harrell start to get really nervous, and if you look at the signups, uh, there's some reason for that, that uh, ability to be nervous from them. Um, David's not here, but he wanted to just highly uh, encourage you guys. There's a, a, a part in your bulletin with a QR code. Super easy to fill out. If technology is not your thing, you can turn the page over, handwrite it, and put it in uh, the offering plate next week or hand to Val or I or anybody, and we will fill that out for you. But we do want to encourage you to try to do that today. Two weeks from this Sunday, October 1st, at 8.30 a.m., we will not be in this building. We'll be across the parking lot in the FLC. As part of WOW, so far we've got almost 20 project sites, just under 10 worship sites, and we need 800 breakfast tacos. That's where Robert gets really nervous. And 15 dozen donuts. We've got nine churches that are going to be a part of it this year, and there's something for all ages and all abilities, and so we do encourage you to do that. So in closing, therefore go and scan the QR code. <laughs> Awesome, Matt. Thank you. That was wonderful. And if you are planning on being a part of the backpack program this year, there's going to be a little uh, organizational meeting right at, after this service and right through those doors. Remember, our backpack room is right over there. Well, it has been an incredible morning of worship. And so, Bishop, will you please bless our sure. our. Well, you have a beautiful church, and your buildings are nice also. <laughs> you are the church. Tienen una iglesia hermosa, y los edificios están bonitos también. Ustedes son la iglesia, ¿verdad? So therefore, you know, sometimes people harm us. They mean to harm us. Sometimes they harm us inadvertently. But how can we, a peop how can we be a people that can look for ways that God can use it for the good? to bless and save and bring hope to a hurting and broken world. Go forth in the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen. <laughs>